Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of the Game of Thrones podcast. I am your host, Carmine of Red Team Review, and I'm joined here once again by the Earl of Lemongrab himself, uh, Preston Jacobs. Preston. This is unacceptable! <laughs> <laughs> That was that was my be- that was my best Leningrad uh, Earl uh, uh, impression. Best Sorry. best Justin Roiland impression. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> well, guys, welcome back to the Game of Thrones podcast. And yes, we are continuing the podcast even after the end of season seven. And this episode, we'll be discussing things from the books that we weren't big fans of or the community didn't like in general. As always, we are available on SoundCloud and iTunes, so consider following us on those platforms to get episodes as they're released. And if you do listen to us on iTunes, then please leave us a review. It would help us out a lot. And be sure to leave your thoughts down in the comments because we may cover them in the next episode. Not only that, but because this is the off-season, we can focus on a lot more questions, theories, and characters, and so on. Also, if you're wondering why this says episode 13 instead of 12, that is because we decided to keep episode 12 as a Patreon exclusive due to the uh, sensitive subject involving why Preston is taboo and the drama surrounding that. And uh, also because it doesn't have anything to do with any major Thrones topic, so yeah, we decided to keep it private. But don't worry, it will be released to the public eventually, but as for now, you can catch it on Preston's Patreon page. So if you are supporting him, then go on ahead and give it a listen. So sensitive, so sensitive. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, the uh, the analogy I was using was uh, it's kind of like if someone tries to burn down your house and then wants you to apologize for it. And then when, you know, Carmine goes and talks to him, he says, dude, I didn't know what matches were for. <laughs> <laughs> don't put me in this holy shit what 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 don't put me in this i'm gonna get an earful no no that like you're in it in the sense that like so, this happened years ago and like i thought that everyone knew all of the information that was out there and then for you to like come back and be like no there's really misunderstandings like this person didn't even know that matches start fires and i'd be like dude that's the whole point that's the whole point matches start fires <laughs> what? like what? What? what listen to the i hope you guys get a chance to listen to it because holy shit y'all what he's saying right now will make sense okay but anyways <laughs> um, we'll release it to the public in a few months don't worry but uh, anyways so yeah preston uh before we start roy the trees died mm. uh he did that's uh, yeah i mean i it's weird because people are like, oh, so sad. Well, no, he, he, he was 95. He lived a really full, rich mm-hmm. life. Uh, a fuller, richer, longer life than nearly all of us are going to live. So he was, he was a very lucky man. Uh, for those um, of you who don't know, Roy Detrice is the guy who does the audiobooks for the Song of Ice and Fire series. And uh, it's a shame he won't get to do the, the next one. But uh, it's also kind yeah. of fitting in a way. Not that he died, but that uh, I've always wanted the actors and maybe some new actors to come in and do their own characters, like, uh, 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 sections in the book. For example, mm. I'll give you, uh, most recently Star Wars came out with the, uh, 40 Years Celebration or something like that book, and, uh, there's a lot of, like, great people who come in and do the audiobook, like Neil Patrick Harris was one of the people who, uh, re- uh read a section, oh. and, uh, I remember in World War Z, the audiobook for that, uh, Mark Hamill actually does a section where the zombies attack Brooklyn. Oh, really? Yeah, it's... Like and you have like different people doing it too, so hopefully they do that for the next for Winds of Winter. There, there are some great uh, readers out there. So Ian Glenn, uh, Jorah Mormont, he actually reads George R. R. Martin's uh, Dying of the Light uh, novelette, mm. and he does a really, really great job uh, of that. And a lot of people really love that Harry Lloyd, the guy who plays Viserys Targaryen, um, did uh, the Duncan Egg. Oh stories. shit! I didn't know that. And everybody says he does. Yeah, or at least I think he redid it when it came out as like the the combined book. Um, but it, I haven't listened to it yet, like with Harry Lloyd. But apparently he, did, he like everyone like raves about it. They say he's fantastic. Well, he is. Uh, isn't he British? Uh, da, 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 da. yeah, yeah. The British is. people always have uh, that great accent for reading books. You know, it's true. It's true. Uh, for dream songs, um, you know, George R. R. Martin's collection of other books, like he got the guy who played Highlander, uh, Adrian Paul. He does a bunch of them, and then one of the wi- the woman, the British woman from Farscape and uh, Stargate, um, 
with like the black hair and the and the she does a really great job of reading. I forgot her name. Oh God. Oh no. I'm sorry to to, to like look her up. <laughs> It's, that's okay, but uh, like I said, I, I hope for she's so she's so good. Actually, I hope I hope for Winds just... of Winter they get like some of the actors to come in and maybe some new people to come in. You know. Oh, Claudia Claudia Black. There you Claudia go. Claudia Black is her name. She's she's she was she does some fantastic mm-hmm. readings. Um, so it'd be I mean it'd be neat if they if they got many like, Roy Detrice was unique in that he could do all of these different voices. Um, really, and <laughs> his his well, Catelyn I mean, sounded the same as his normal voice. I don't know about that. <laughs> so so yeah, this is this is also the criticism is is that is so he got this world record thing, this Guinness Book of World Records thing for doing something like two hundred voices for for the Ice and Fire mm-hmm. books, which is like he's look he's an incredible guy who can do all these different voices. But he can't do 200. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, like, you're right that, like, they get recycled. <laughs> like, in the end, Tyrion has the same voice as Daenerys, which is really kind of funny. I never liked how he called Peter Baylor, like, Pitar. I never liked that. And... <laughs> or Brian. And he, he, switch, he switches the, the, the pronunciation of quite a few uh, characters, like, going along. Sometimes it's, sometimes it's Amory Lorch. Sometimes it's Amory Lorch. Sometimes it's Brienne, sometimes it's Brienne. You know, it's but fitting though. It's it's whatever. almost it's almost meme culture status at this point for. Yeah, for I mean, I don't I don't get angry at the pronunciation of name stuff just because like I say things weirdly and people like like just yell at me. No matter how one you're gonna say something, someone's gonna. Dude, get Dude, I angry. feel like people yell at me like, more than yell at you. Like the only thing you say weird or different is uh, Varys instead of Varys. Like I say Cersei. Instead of Cersei, and uh, people got on my case for I say Viseron. I say Ariana. A lot of people, a lot of people say Ariane, and I say Ariana. Ariane. Yeah. You're adding the extra A which, in there, which is fine. That's that's. But like, what was during the during the season? Like, I called him Viseron. It's not Viseron, is it? Oh, like Viserion. Yeah, just where you put the emphasis. Yeah. yeah. But the re- the reason the reason I do the Ariana is is I didn't ever know an Ariane before before starting mm-hmm. the book and. Ariana is like a Spanish and Middle Eastern name, which is what Dorne is kind of based on. So like when I was reading the story, I was like, oh, it just flows, Ariana. Like Ariana's Ariana's a very common Middle Eastern name and a, a fairly common Spanish name. And so when you say like, you know, I see it, I go, oh, Ariana, because uh, that's a real name. I'd, I'd never known an Ariane. Now, I eventually found out that the woman in that Access Hollywood uh, grab him by the pussy video was named Ariane. Um, the one they're about, the one that, 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 um, Drumpf and, and, uh, and Billy Bush what are about to meet. Her, Drumpf? The f- why did you call him that? That's the, 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 that was, that was the name of his family before they, they moved to America and then they changed it. But yeah, no, his real name is Drumpf. Yeah. Okay. Whatever. <laughs> whatever. Uh, let's fucking, let's, let's, let's rest in peace. Roy Detrice. I'm, I can't count the number of hours I've spent listening to his voice. Mm. It's, uh, it's, um, so yeah, it was quite, it was, it was, you know, it's, it's too bad. He's, it's too bad. He's gone, but you know, he lived a long, full life. So we should be, we should be happy for that. I, I wonder who's gonna, <laughs> I would, I would love it if they got, uh, like, the Amelia Clark to come in and, and, and read Danny stuff and, <laughs> and read all the Danny diarrhea chapters and all the weird other, like, in, sex in her stuff. fucking, in her fucking deadpan monotone voice. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So her Preston, diary. Preston has collected a bunch of things. Now, I will say before we get into that, what the community mm. dislikes about the books, we, we discussed this last time. Um, uh, what I really don't like is, uh, from what I can remember, is the uh, <laughs> the Wayward Bride chapter. That's the chapter you said where the Black Bush stuff comes in. <laughs> yeah, I is... <laughs> like. Here's the thing. I when you told me about uh, Asha and Carl the Maid getting together, I was like, "What? Wait, she has? She's probably pregnant with his baby? What? I didn't understand what you were talking about because not that I, I didn't remember. Oh, we, we may have I... to go over this. We, 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 we may have to go over this again because yeah. we um. So, so Carmen and I like sat down for like 45 minutes and tried to record last week and it just went horribly. Both of us were just out of it and we talked about a whole bunch of different stuff and we kept switching topics, but it was just, it was, it was disastrous. And so we decided to redo this. 
So, but yes, we talked, we, we, we talked about Wayward Bride. Yeah. I, I never, I, cause I, I, whenever I feel like a sex scene is coming on, I skip a couple <laughs> of uh, sentences down. Cause it's so cringy. Like, like you, you said it best. Like when you're reading these sex scenes in the book, you, you kind of like picture the author in your head, just writing this. And I'm like, ah, oh, dude, I don't want to. Yeah. What stuff is, you know, cause I think about authors write what they know. Mm-hmm. And so I immediately think of the author having sex which is not a pleasant <laughs> <laughs> but yeah so yeah carl the maid and asha have a very have a very detailed sex scene where he uh it's specifically talked about how he 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 ejaculates inside her and she specifically thinks that she uh needs to take some moon tea but then stannis captures her before she's able to take moon tea so you know it's been it's been, I guess, about sixty days since uh, in the story since since uh, Asha and Carl the maid had sex. So she might be pregnant, but she wouldn't know. I mean, she may have been. She may be late on a period or something, but she wouldn't. She wouldn't exactly know uh, if she's pregnant or not. Some people don't like Bran's uh, storyline in the first couple of books mm. because mm, that can yeah. be a little slow sometimes. Even in the show, I wasn't a big fan of it. I will tell you. Um, and this, this is weird because some people love analyzing these things. I am not a fan of the dream sequences. Why? Like, I in, and it's not George R. R. Martin. It's in general dream sequences in books. Like, unless the like, dreams tend to not have any influence on the plot. And, and it's a little different in Ice and Fire because dreams are usually messages being sent to people. But usually, when you run into a dream sequence in in a, in a movie, it's just time filler. It's you know, it's like person wakes up and then the it's it's a reset button and you're like oh well that didn't change anything there's a few there's a few exceptions there's a dream sequence in like the fourth season of angel that like makes a big difference um and is relevant uh because it like makes angel lose his soul and stuff like that but but otherwise like dream sequences for the most part you can just skip over them because they they don't really they don't really mean anything. Even you know? Jamie's dream sequence where he sees his mom. Well, that's the thing is that one's really important because it makes his, it makes him change his mind, right? It mm-hmm. changes the course of the story. But e- and even the most famous dream dream sequence, um, uh, the, the the Tower of Joy, like it gives us some backstory. I suppose it changed Eddard's motivation. I mean, he's he's, you know, so but people don't notice that they're like oh wait Eddard was ready to leave king's landing and now he's not because you know after the tower of joy scene but we, we're not sure why so it, you know but i'm trying to think of some like useless dream sequences like um uh brianne has a bunch has a dream sequence like right before she wakes up with lady stoneheart and i completely forgot what it's about like Cause it's just forgettable. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, like um, Bran has a bunch of dreams where he's like climbing up towers and flying with the crow. And later he has a dream sequence where he's, where he's, you know, sees a tree and a raven. And then there's dream sequences where there, where he's like a wolf marking territory and talking about blood in his mouth. And you're just like, ah, this doesn't, it doesn't advance the plot for me. So I, I'm not a fan of dream sequences generally. Well, you gave me a list of here of what uh, people don't like. Uh, but before mm. we get into that, what don't you like? What's what's not something that's that's your favorite? Um, so Besides dreams. And I, I put, I, no, I put this on the list, but I am not a fan of uh, Jamie's A Feast for Crows uh, story. Um, Where he's basically going around uh, uh, wandering the Riverlands. Right. And, I, you know, I've talked about this. I was actually thinking about it today because uh, I, I was writing on a board about it. But it's Jamie's A Feast for Crow story is very different from, say, Brienne's A Feast for Crow story as, as, a, as a comparison. Like if you read Brienne's story all the way through, it's one story. Like, you know, it, it the themes are all the same dealing with like Brienne's uh, uh, nature in a sexist world, her her history uh, an embarrassment, you know, not being a girl that fits in, how it relates to Randall Tarley, how it relates to Heil Hunt, 
how it relates to Shagwell and Worgen Biter who meet them and how that is a callback to, to the a Storm of Swords story where her and Jamie go through the Riverlands. The story flows um, pretty well and is a pretty cohesive story. Uh, Jamie's story, on the other hand, is just all over the place. Like one chapter, it's about his daddy issues with, <laughs> with him standing vigil. And then the next one, he's like doing an investigation where he's going down and, and t- into the, the black cells and, and trying to figure out, you know, how Tyrion escaped and what went on. And then he's arguing with Cersei. And then he's at Derry and he's dealing with his cousin. And then he's at Harrenhal and he's dealing with Bonifer Hasty. And he's trying to, and he's thinking about whether or not he, he can be Golden Hand, a, the, a, a, good, a good man, you know, going forward. And then he's at River Run negotiating a situation with the phrase and, 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 you know, Brendan Tully. And then after that, he goes to, to Penny Tree and starts talking to the Blackwoods and the Brackens. There's no thematic connection. There's a little bit of a thematic connection because he thinks back to, to Cersei a lot and his jealousy there, but there's no thematic connection to any of like the places he is mm-hmm. in the story. And so it doesn't, it doesn't flow in any sense. Like you're not sure where Jamie's going or, um, where his character's going in, in that, which is, you know, very different from his, his A Storm of Swords story, which is, you know, this, this wonderful trajection of, of kind of understanding Brienne and, and her being such an important part of his character change and, and him eventually kind of breaking free and, and choosing his own destiny at the end. Um, and, you know, yeah, Feast for Crows just kind of muddles that. It just kind of puts it on, I don't know. It's just, he's not doing anything. He's, he's providing backstory, you know, and, and world building and that's it. Uh, what else do you have here? You also have here, uh, Tyrion's of Clash of Kings story. A lot of dwarf sex mm. with Shay. Uh, <laughs> uh, Preston, what's wrong with dwarf sex? Uh, no, nothing's, this. nothing's, nothing's wrong with dwarf sex. Um, if, 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 if you're a dwarf and you like having sex, that's fantastic. If you like to have sex with dwarves, it's fantastic. Um, but hearing about Tyrion's dwarf sex with Shay, um, it's just, I don't know. It's, you, you don't really want to hear about it. I mean, maybe you don't want to hear Roy Detrice narrating it. Maybe that's a big part of it. Uh, to, be, to be honest, but, I, I'm, in a, I'm in a complete agreement. It's not that I, I hate Tyrion or anything, but uh, he, he's not he's not like how he looks in in, in, in the show. He, right, he looks he's, exactly he's, how you think. Yeah, I mean, even if it were if it were perhaps when when I read the books, I don't even picture um, Peter Dinklage, who, as comic comic book girl nineteen said, the the Brad Pitt of dwarves. <laughs> so, you know, he's a very good looking uh, a dwarf. You know, but Tyrion is a very ugly, like book Tyrion is a very ugly dwarf, you know, so I, I picture a very different man, you know, the, the, uh, a waddling, um, awkward, ugly dwarf with a huge brow, you know, trying to have sex with this, uh, with this 18 year old girl. Um, what did Common Booker and I seen call Tyrion in the, in the show? He's like the Brad Pitt of dwarves. Yeah. Brad Pitt of dwarves. <laughs> yeah. Which is completely, yeah. Um, but it's more to the Tyrion. The, the, the Tyrion a Clash of Kings story is, it's 15 freaking chapters. And it just goes on and on and on. Um, and I don't know. I, I think it's kind of slow. I feel, like, I feel like George R. R. Martin was killing time with it a bit. And I think a lot of people kind of feel, I mean, it gets exciting at the end with the, with the Battle of the Blackwater. But I think, I think, um, I think a lot of people complain about the uh, about the Tyrion's uh, A Clash of Kings story. Well, I understand Tyrion's uh, being, you know, having 15 chapters because, you know, the, George is trying to show what's going on in King's Landing politically. And uh, yeah, Sansa, on the other to, hand, yeah. she, it's, she's just showing the audience what's going on in the inner workings of the Red Keep. So I get yeah, it. She has she has eight chapters. So we have a lot of coverage of King's Landing in that book. Um People people give a lot of shit about the Sansa stories being boring. What's funny is they don't they don't give the same shit about the Tyrion stories, which um, I think I think the two of them are on par in, in in a Clash of Kings. I think Tyrion's story gets really exciting in in A Storm of Swords because 
because Oberyn shows up. Well, and, do, you, uh, do you think she... they should have switched out uh, Sansa's uh, point of view chapters with Cersei in the second book? Oh, that would be interesting. Like, introducing Cersei... Um, in the second book instead of the fourth book, because... Uh, like like I said, I understand why Sansa's in there. It's to show us what's going on in the inner workings of the Red Keep, how people are treating her, how she sees yeah. other people. That's fine, but can't we just get the same thing from Cersei? We could have, and Cersei, Cersei is a much more entertaining, or even, insane... Or yeah. even, uh, this is controversial, or even Joffrey, because then we'd cover everybody. Because not, Cersei's not always uh, hanging out with Sansa, but Joffrey, on the other hand, holy shit. That's true, that's true. Um, George R. R. Martin has written... Um, has written a few stories where the protagonist is is a complete psychopath. Um, Cersei is probably the the closest to that we've we've had in the uh, in the book. I mean, I guess Chet is pretty off, um, but that's just for one chapter. But uh, it would would have been interesting to have that early on to have a Cersei Chet, to have Cersei point of view. And what you have also here is, uh, in regards to Sansa, is the uh, Storm of Swords uh, storyline with her. The long wait mm. until the Purple Wedding. Tell us more about that. Well, again, with with both... So Sansa's story from, from A Clash of Kings to A Storm of Swords, uh, essentially Dantos shows up and says, okay, I'm going to kidnap you, or we're going to run off together. And she's like, great, we're going to run off together. And then they don't run off for 12 chapters, two books. Like it takes quite a long time. Like you start thinking like how many pages like of book, like thousands of pages, you know, more than a thousand pages before that, before that happens. And so Sansa's just kind of waiting around for that. And there's some other plots like, Oh, you might marry Willis, you know, and, and stuff like that. But, and her having her, her period and, 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 Joffrey uh, tormenting her and then there's but for the most part it's uh it's a pretty boring I think well I I agree I agree with the, the with the with the majority opinion like so many people trash the Sansa chap those ch- Sansa chapters is pretty boring and I kind of agree like even her battle of the Blackwater is more suspenseful like it's her she's not at the battle she's you know in the Red Keep with with all of the the women um, sitting there dealing with uh, you know dealing with the fact that you know maybe they're going to get executed mm-hmm. you know or not you know so it's more suspenseful. Well, let me ask you this: but, How would you spice up Sansa's stuff in the Clash of Kings and leading up to the Purple Wedding to make it more enjoyable for the reader? What would you put in there? Huh? Because I would I would just cut her shit in half and give uh and, and have Cersei in there. Might as well. Or even Joffrey, I, for that matter. That'd be great. You know, so you know how in the book, or not in the book, in the show, Sansa is constantly saying that she learned all this stuff from, from Cersei. Um, but in reality, they share, like, what, two or three scenes? I don't even know. Like, I think it probably would be more interesting if Cersei kind of took Sansa under her wing and she was constantly following around Sans. Uh, she was she was constantly following around Cersei. Even if you didn't have to do Cersei's crazy point of view, which is a great reveal for a Feast for Crows. Like holy crap! Like you know, Cersei was really insane. Um, it would, like as a you know, handmaid or something like that, or uh... yeah, yeah, something like that, or force her, force Sansa to be like Cersei's lady in waiting or something, and then then you'd at least you'd at least have her closer to the action. Um, cause there's a lot of, there's a lot of, I guess there's some more action between, you know, what Cersei and Tyrion are doing to each other in that story. Instead, Varys has to communicate a lot of this stuff, like what the, what the queen has done and what the queen thinks. Um, you get, a, you get a lot told to us rather than it's seeing it. It would have been maybe interesting if, if Sansa were seeing it following around Cersei. That's that's kind of what I wanted season seven Sansa to be. Basically, someone who has followed Cersei around, has learned from her, and is basically doing exactly what Cersei was doing. It would it would have been very telling to Sansa's character, seeing her grow up in this twisted world with everybody abusing her, and her kind of fighting back, just like Cersei fought back in her own way. Yeah, that's what I wanted they, for I mean, Sansa. They, but they te- they teased us with it, you know, like you know, with John saying, "Oh, it sounds like you admire her," 
and then i don't know it just didn't it didn't really go there <laughs> oh, we we i don't want to get into a season seven's uh wrongdoings yeah, yeah. again because that's a slippery slope i'm still pissed oh, off yeah. about season four's uh darth sansa crap and getting nothing <laughs> i still remember all this I mean, all the other fucking video. I didn't do a Dark Santa video, but so many. I saw so many Dark Santa videos. Like, oh my god, she's finally coming into her own Dark Santa, Raven dress. <laughs> oh, man. I know what you're talking Nothing. about. I know. I know exactly what you're talking. About. Like 20 Nothing. minute videos analyzing like the dress and how she's gonna make her comeback. It's gonna be like Sansa, but Empire Strikes Back, and then <laughs> she gets nothing. 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 <laughs> Oh god! Holy shit! Uh, but anyways, okay. So yeah, like I said, what I would do is I would cut Sansa's chapters in half from a fe- uh, from a Clash of Kings and just include. Uh, I really, I really would love a Joffrey chapter, and it's a shame we never got that, or even a Robert Baratheon ch- chapter, because I don't know. Like a lot of the times, I feel George really does focus on characters who don't really have that much going on. Yeah, yeah. Now I think a Sans- uh, Sansa's chapter has improved in the Storm of Swords because. I mean, I guess there's the really strong chapter where she meets the Queen of Thorns, and um, you get kind of that, and then and then the Purple Wedding and her escape, uh, and then oh man, and then when she gets to the Vale, things get really interesting because Lysa is a whole bunch of fun, you know, <laughs> like <laughs> she, you know, you know, but um, yeah, so it's kind of just waiting for everything to get to the to get to the veil. What else do you have here on the list? Do you have uh, the list of things that a lot of people don't like about the the whole thing? Well, I, I'm I'm th- I'm remembering back to my first time reading through, and I think my first time reading through, I had a real trouble with the Arya, the Arya chapters in both A Clash of Kings and A Storm of Swords, because mm. um, she wanders a bit meeting all of these different groups of people that are kind of similar. And like later on now, like, you know, I've studied this stuff and, you know, I could be like, oh, the mountains men are completely different from the brave companions who are completely different from Rourke and Biter. Um, who are completely different from the brotherhood without banners. And yeah, but when you're at the time, you're like, which group are we talking about? Amory, Amory Lorch. Is he different from the mountain men? You know, mm-hmm. so is he not the brave companions? I like figuring out who was part of whose group was a real chore with Arya. Um, and she had a lot of chapters. I think it's, it's 10 in a clash of Kings and 14 in a storm of swords. So, I think she has the most chapters in one of them, but it's, it's a massive amount. Um, by comparison, I mean, if you were like Sansa has, I mean, uh, Arya has 10 chapters in a clash of Kings. I know by comparison, Danny has five. And I think in a storm of swords, Arya has 14 and Danny has seven. So, I mean, Arya is getting twice as much time as Danny. Why though? Who has why, the dragons. Why does he focus so much on Arya? Uh, I mean, Arya, I think he focuses on her because Arya is like his favorite type of character to write, um, which I'm surprised he doesn't have more Asha chapters because Asha and Arya are very similar. Um, he should, you know, he should have more Asha cat chapters as well, because that's that's like that's like the, the type of person I think George R. Martin's in love with is, is like an Arya Asha, like, you know, strong, fierce, tomboyish. Uh, woman who who takes shit from no one, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, no, he gives a lot of time to her. Tw- I mean, like I said, those two books, twenty four freaking chapters of of Arya wandering around the Riverlands. I quite enjoyed Arya's stuff. I mean, it was also it had a had a bit of mystery in a sense with uh, Jockin. Arya was actually one of my favorites in in the first book, in A Game of Thrones, and I was curious to see like would she ever get even get back to Winterfell? And it's sad how she never makes it. I was just really confused. That's all, mm-hmm. you know, because she she runs into so many different groups. I mean, she, like, she runs into, oh crap! Like on top of that, Bruce Bolton. And then, at the time, I was so confused about everybody's allegiances. Like, wait, who does Bruce? Who is Bruce Bolton for? Like, who are the Brave <laughs> Companions for? Like, it took me a while to like puzzle out like everybody's allegiances. Like, it just, like, wait, the Brave Companions defected from. Rob to Bruce 
Bolton to to Tywin. I, yeah, I, wait, I can they're, see they're away that. From, no, no, wait, they were with Tywin, and then they were with to Bruce Bolton, yeah. and then, ah, uh, you know, and then so it was like I, you know I have it all straight now, but the first time through it was it was a, it was a real pain, and in fact one of the reasons the Dornish Master Plan came about was me going back and saying you know I really need to figure out these Arya chapters. And going back and being like, who the hell are these brave companions? <laughs> like, and trying to figure out who they are and why they kept popping up. Because um, I probably wouldn't have gone back and, and read those Arya chapters had I not like read the Brienne story and gone, wait a minute, who are the fucking brave companions and who are Rorg and Biter? Because I need to go back and like really get where these characters are and um, what they want and what their motivations are. Because... When the, your first read, you're just like, well, everybody's an, everybody in Westeros is an insane piece of shit. <laughs> well, well, like, well, they're a little too fucking extreme. Like, doesn't that one point the mountain cut off some guy's like limbs and feed it to him or something like that? Oh yeah, it's 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 off the yeah, that's Vargo Ho. Yeah. yeah, he he um and yeah, and Rorg and Biter are chopping off tits and and everybody's threatening each other, and then Rorg and Biter join the Brave Companions, and so. It gets it gets really messy, um, like which completely insane psychopath is part of, you know, whichever insane psychopath posse. So it was, um, so that that's that was a bit messy. I mean, maybe he didn't need so many insane psychopath posses. Like, was there a need to have Amory Lorch and his posse be different from the Mountain's Men posse? I think so. I, it, it just shows that no matter what what corner you turn to, there you, you can't. There's not just one boogeyman. There's like multiple ones, and no matter no matter where you go, you're not you're gonna find more of these guys. Mm. You're trying to escape the brave companions. Boom! You run into the mountains men. Trying to escape the mountains men. Boom! You run into Ramsey's uh, bastards boys. You know. Yeah. So w- one of the things I was telling you about before we recorded, uh, I was looking <laughs> I was looking up the the, the subject and. Uh, Apparently, there was one person I, I was reading. They have a problem with the, how a Feast for Crows has so many point of view characters whose letters start, uh, whose names start with the letter A, <laughs> like Arya, Ario, Ariane, uh, Asha, Elaine, and then you have what, what's his name? Ari. How, how, how did you uh, pronounce his name? Arian. Aaron. Aaron. Like, like, there you go. Like uh, the damp hair. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I, I understand. The one thing that uh, I will say though is a Clash of Kings is my least favorite. Mm. I know I know Feast for Crows gets a lot of shit, and to be honest, I did stop reading A Song of Ice and Fire when A Feast for Crows came out. I tried to get into it. I really couldn't, and the only reason I ever finished it is because I heard that HBO was doing A Song of Ice and Fire, the adaptation. So I went back into it and schlepped through it. But uh, A Feast for Crows is not that bad, but it gets a lot of shit. But uh, you put here that uh, the one thing you hate is how everybody in A Feast for Crows is just wandering around doing nothing. <laughs> no, I mean, I I think people think that about because you have both the Jamie and Brienne story wandering around in the Riverlands. After we just had a we just had two books of people wandering around in the Riverlands, right? You mm-hmm. you had you had Arya wandering around the Riverlands for two books, and then Jamie and Brienne wander around the Riverlands together for a book, and then you have another book. Where now Brienne and Jamie are going back and wandering around the Riverlands some more. I mean, yeah, you know, and I get that Brienne was in was in the was in the Crackclaw Point, which isn't technically the Riverlands, but whatever. It's 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 just her wandering aimlessly, right? Seemingly aimlessly. Like Feast for Crows grows on me, and now I think it's really great. Um, and but um, yeah, I can see a lot of people having problems with it. Uh, it's, it's funny, like. All these characters wandering around in the Riverlands, and like I, I feel like I know more about <laughs> about like uh, Winterfell, the North, more than I do about the Riverlands. Because they don't yeah. really explore ex- they don't really explore the Riverlands that much to the point where I know I know every nook and cranny, like it's some kind of RPG game, you know. Well, they explore the wilderness of the Riverlands. So, like, you don't even get to learn about the houses or the house loyalty. I mean, you get to hear you get to hear about House Smallwood, you know, and, um, <laughs> you know, at some point, like, they pass, Brienne passes by House Brune, and you learn a lot about Duskendale. 
but you know you don't you don't learn too much when when they're just wandering around the riverlands like a random you you learn about a lot of some random inns <laughs> but yeah it's not like you're you're getting the 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 inner workings of um of of too much you know like i said i i feel as though they could spice up a lot of these uh, older books maybe he could like release another book a, a small one uh, detailing uh, certain characters' point of views we didn't get because I was really looking forward to. This was back like before the internet was like really big when I when I started reading it. But I was really looking forward to getting maybe uh, <laughs> like a Joffrey chapter or even a Ramsay chapter or even oh, a like Roose what they did with like what they did with Twilight. Yeah. You know what I'm didn't talking they, about? I I think so. where you mean? Didn't she like re? -re I think I I think I do. Didn't she re release the book with like Edward's point of view? Yeah, she like wrote the book again. <laughs> But from Edward's point of view, instead of <laughs> instead of uh, from Bell Bell is that her name? Bella. Bella Bella. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's just I, I would really like a like I would really like a, a point of views from like uh, characters you don't expect who could be really interesting. Like le, like what is Thorn up to? Like le, why does Thorn hate him so much? Or or maybe even Mance Raider or or Tormund or maybe even. Um, dark star in the in the south like characters point of view you wouldn't expect i, I would like it would be that would be a really fucking great idea like imagine if like a game of thrones was released but instead it's walder frey varis <laughs> walder frey varis littlefinger <laughs> roos bolton like that would be an incredible fucking. Wait a minute, Walder Frey, Littlefinger, Rose Bo So game, a Game of Thrones, the asshole edition. Got it. The asshole edition, and then eventually you move into a Feast for Crows with the Doran Martell perspective. Yeah, <laughs> because because the story is is structured as a mystery. Like he's purposely putting the point of view characters as the most out of it dumb characters, <laughs> <laughs> right? Like Ario Hota or Eddard. You know, like, they're just, they're so out of it. You're like, oh, God, you're so stupid. <laughs> you're getting played. <laughs> Actually, uh, someone, someone someone said this to me a while ago, and, and I, I kind of agree with them. For for a Storm of Swords, I would have loved, because uh, someone said, we should have gotten, like, an Obra Martell chapter or point of view when he's fighting the mountain. I actually would have loved the point of view of the mountain versus Oberyn. Oh, she, my God. Like, like, we don't have enough antagonist point of views in, in Game of Thrones because it's easy to hate Ramsay. It's easy, it's easy to yeah. hate Roose Bolton and, and Tywin for the most part. But... Uh, I, I'm sure they have their own perspectives. I mean, I, I was the only one that argued against... I was argued for Roose Bolton betraying Rob because Rob was making all of these dumb decisions. He was losing allies left and right. And uh, Roose Bolton had to save his own skin. Well, I mean, when you think about it, the best chapters in A Feast for Crows were, were, were perhaps Cersei's. And <clears throat> she's kind of a... Hor she's pretty much a horrible person. And then the Victorian chapters are really awesome. And the Aeron chapters are really awesome, and they're pretty horrible people. And the Theon chapters in A Dance with Dragons are the best, and he's, you know, not really a great guy either. Um, and so, really, George R. R. Martin is, is at his best when he's writing from a dark, evil, or gray position. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, George R. R. Martin's most acclaimed story, like short story, <clears throat> that won the most awards is called Sand Kings. And that's written from a psychopath's point of view. Or at least he becomes a psychopath uh, in the story. Well, go into um, this. Tell me more about this because you're, you're, you're the, I think that you're the only Game of Thrones YouTuber who really goes into George's other works, as far as I, I know. And, uh, but yeah, tell me about this one. Well, I, I'm doing it for my next uh, Thousand Worlds book club, which is actually going to come out, I guess, in a few in a few days. It's been a, it's been a long break, but you know, I've been going through uh, his Thousand Worlds stories, and yeah, Sand Kings is from the perspective of of a, of a psychopath um, who he gets he gets some alien pets, and then he has to deal with these alien pets, and it's the story is also structured um, as a as a a parable about religion and and the the evolution of society and whether or not, um, you know, people, you know, society moving past religion and things like this and the, the function of religion, um, you know, keep in mind, George R. R. Martin's an atheist. And so he doesn't have a very good view of religion. Um, 
<clears throat> but yeah, it's 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 Sand Kings has all these awards, and I think one of the big reasons was is that not only is he doing he has an interesting, well paced horror narrative, but also and also that he's making comments about society and 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 religion and 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 politics, but then he's also taking it from the perspective of a psychopath. And all of those things together, like kind of hit all of the, you know, all the cylinders were, were firing and the story really came together, which I think is why it's so, it's so uh, praised. Um, yeah, that's Sand Kings. It's probably, <clears throat> it's very similar to Ice and Fire in, in many ways. I so. wanted to ask you about, someone on, someone on Patreon asked me to uh, ask you if you've ever read Fever Dream which is uh, ah. supposed to be some kind of weird vampire novel. Uh, I got two questions on this. Number one, what the mm. hell is Fever Dream? Uh, how, how, do, how does it relate to Game of Thrones in any way? <clears throat> and are there vampires in the world of Ice and Fire? <clears throat> um, so Fever Dream is probably... It's, Fever Dream is not very related to Ice and Fire. Uh, maybe in some broad themes. Um, so Fever Dream is about... It takes place in the 1800s on a riverboat, mostly. Um, the protagonist is a, is a big fat riverboat captain. Um, and in the world, there's an ancient race of people that kind of look like Valyrians. They've got freaking blonde, long blonde hair again, and are beautiful and all of this. And everybody thinks they're vampires because they, I think they have an iron deficiency. And so they have to drink blood. Um, but then it's like true blood where they, where somebody's come up with a way to drink like a, an iron rich potion. And so you, they don't have to, they can move past sucking blood, but they're not, ex they're called vampires, but they're not exactly vampires. They don't turn people, which is a, uh, which is a normal vampire thing. That's right? like the vampire theme. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I read an article once that said, that said every vampire story <clears throat> first breaks the rules of vampires. Like How every so? vampire story is like, well, like take, take, um, twilight, like, their vampires don't disintegrate in the sun. Oh no, that's Hollywood stuff. Real vampires sparkle, you know. And you're like, oh god. Or if you watch Lost Boys, like they make a big deal about Lost Boys, how they're like garlic doesn't work, and then they're like holy water does, and they like shoot them, you know. And you're like, yeah, okay. Everybody's got to break one of the. They always have to break one of the rules of vampires, you know, to be different. But yeah, so the rule the rule that George R. R. Martin breaks is they don't they don't turn each other. They're just an ancient race of people. Well, yeah. I, I like I like how uh, I like how True Blood uh, <laughs> basically came in, and uh, I, I like what they did regarding the vampire mythology, where they uh, they spread false information about vampires when they were in the clo in the closet, so to speak. Mm. Like, uh, well, uh, vampires. If I was a vampire, you couldn't see my reflection. Oh, okay. Good, good thought. Back when humanity was dumb. Oh, good point. Yeah, okay. Like they spread that misinformation. Uh, I, I really like that. But are, are there any vampires kind of like the Stidagoi from uh, from uh, the uh, FX's The Strain, where they're just monsters that just feed on you for blood? Well, I mean, I think the closest example we have is Blood Raven. I mean, he him being really really old and drinking blood through weirwood trees but i think that's like the furthest we're gonna we're, we're that's you know the furthest we're gonna get like i don't believe that Roose bolton is a is a is a is a vampire is, bolton you know the bolton theory right <laughs> um but yeah i don't think we we don't really have any human beings that live longer than 150 years and Nobody's really sucking any blood or anything like that. How would you feel if, if, if something like that did happen? If Roose Bolton, maybe he survives on, uh, like, uh, he has his own personal cache of uh, weirwood blood or whatever, and he survives on that, and he, and he lives for a while. How would you feel if that was, like, a, like a thing they revealed in the books? I wouldn't, I wouldn't like it just because the, the amount of magic that, that exists in the world of Ice and Fire. But would that be magic, any... though? Well, that's the thing is like you have to you have to establish rules, right? And then and then play within those rules. So like, you know, do we have anything like vampires? Um, I mean, I suppose like body swapping is the thing that's established. So if Roose Bolton were a body swapper, like that would kind of make sense. But, um, you know, to have to have some sort of like magical blood sucking aspect to it. We haven't come across that yet. Hmm. 
so so I'd be like, oh, this is maybe I'd be like, this is new. This must be bad. No, but <laughs> I would be like, it would it wasn't it, you know it wasn't well established. This is one of the reasons like a lot of people think that like um, that uh, that Euron is going to cast this big spell. And he's going to win by casting a big spell. And then he's doing blood magic. And I'm like, well, that would kind of come out of, like out from nowhere, right? We haven't had any big blood magic spell. Like, you know, like there hasn't been anything like that. So if it happened, we'd be like, well, where is that coming from? All of a sudden you can have like massive uh, magic Armageddon spells that like kill hundreds of people. Mm-hmm. Um, which is why I don't see it coming, you know, like it, it just, we, we haven't been introduced to that magic yet. Going back to the random George R. R. Martin books, um, the whole mm. fever dream, like what's the weirdest, this is something I wanted to ask you for a while. What's the weirdest spinoff George R. R. Martin book, uh, from a song of ice and fire, like not, not song of ice and fire related, like just what, what's the most weirdest, what's the most random weirdest George R. R. Martin book that you've read I mean, so I've far? T- I've told you about Meat House Man, yeah. Meat House Man, yeah. Mm-hmm. Meat House Man is about. I've, I'm sure I've told you this before. It's about a guy who he lives on a world that where where it's legal to use dead bodies as uh, as slave labor, and so they have like telepathic. They have telepathic electrodes in their bodies, and then they've they have corpse handlers who can control these telepathic. Guys, kind of like Vermeer, how Vermeer six skins can control six different animals at once. This guy can control, you know, a whole bunch of corpses at once. And then, and then he, um, they also like have corpses, corpses at the whorehouse. And then he, uh, you know, he fucks corpses at the corpse house. And <laughs> that's right. And, and then, yeah, it's, it's it's the darkest. It's one of the darkest, weirdest stories. But no, the weirdest story is fucking Night Flyers, man. Night Flyers. Night Flyers, God, which one's a... that? Have we discussed that one yet? Oh, God. Night Flyers is about this crew of people that are on a ship trying to study this intergalactic alien, or galactic alien, intragalactic alien, where this gal- this alien is flying across the galaxy at, you know, a sublight speed. And this is very curious, because they're like, well, why is this huge alien flying across the galaxy and has been for thousands of years Wait, have they, so they captured the, have it. they captured the alien is it in the ship or no it's enormous okay. it's like it's like uh, it's an enormous thing you know kind of like the crystalline entity in star trek the next generation it's this enormous thing called the vulcran and you know these this group of academics goes to like study it and so they hire this this ship called the night flyer um, and the dude who, who runs it is a shut-in, and he doesn't want to see him. So the captain's behind a, a closed door, and they're all, they're all really curious after months on the ship. They're like, what's this dude's story? So let, they decide to like break into the computers, and then they all start dying off one by one, and they're like, oh, man, the captain's killing us. And then it turns out it's not the captain, but his dead, cross-gendered clone lover mother whose whose personality was downloaded into the computer but she still maintains telekinesis and telepathy what yo man it's so <laughs> fucked up so like i was telling you about this before and uh because i know you like this kind of stuff where the like the story is like the the, the norm is turned upside down and this is also kind of not really not really what you're writing in your own book but uh reminded me a little of it so one mm. of my favorite authors is uh, Robert Highland. He's the guy, I think I said his name right. He's the guy who wrote Starship Troopers. I I really like that yeah, book. Yeah. I like I love the movie too. He had this he had this book. I uh this is like this story I, I read a while ago called uh Far- Farnham's Freehold and it's basically about um this uh like uh this rich family uh, Farnham's his wife, his son, his daughter, you know, and and their their servant who is a black guy, and an African American, BPC a little, um, and it's in the it's in the area where the U S. and the Soviet unions have heightened tension, and apparently mm-hmm. the Soviet unions bombs start to go off. The Soviet unions launches their bombs. The United States launches their bombs. Bombs are flying all over the place. So they go in their fallout shelter, and when the bombs hit, apparently it blows them into the future, and the future is. Highly advanced, everybody's educated, but the problem is, the 
it, the problem is white people are enslaved by African Americans. Huh. If you're black, you are very educated and you have a lot of uh, very highly educated and you have like a lot of technology and you have white slaves. And a lot of the white slaves are either castrated or they're just incredibly dumb. And uh, eventually, <laughs> do you want me to spoil what happens at the end? It's re- yeah, yeah, let's do it. it Spoilers, guys. Uh, <laughs> apparently, uh, Farnham and his, you know, his, it, they don't... By the way, they're 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 only slaves. They're only saved from being slaves themselves because their 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 black servant he he steps in and speaks French and saves them all um, from being slaves. But uh, apparently, the the black scientists invent this time machine uh, and uh, are going to use the the family to go back in time before this all began, before the bombs hit. And apparently, the time machine is successful, and they do go back in time, and you know, right before the bombs hit, and they get in their car to try to drive off. But the car- <laughs> when they go back, it's like a completely alternate universe, and the the reason they come to that conclusion is because the person's car. <laughs> the reason they come to the conclusion is because the person's car was originally an automatic. And now in this universe, it's a shift. It's a it's a stick. So that's they come to the conclusion. But every everything else is the same. Everything is the universe. same except for that one little detail. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck? It's it's called Farnham's Freehold. I I may have gotten the little things wrong. Definitely look it up. It's it's fucking crazy. But it kind of. Rem- I was expecting something like you know like with Planet of the Apes, like the Marky Mark version. Or Back to the Future 2, right? Where they, like, go back. They go back and everything's different. And it's like, they go back, but all automatics are manuals. (laughs) Like, what? The Marky Mark first. It's it's Ape Abraham Lincoln instead of... (laughs) Yeah. What the fuck? (laughs) Oh, Jesus. Which apparently is close. It's closer to the Planet of the Apes book. Um the Planet of the Apes book uh, apparently ends somewhat like that, where they don't really. The original, the original Planet of the Apes is written by some French dude, and they actually go to a Planet of the Apes. It's not Earth, but he goes to the Planet of the Apes. He has his adventures, and then he gets back in his ship. And when he gets home to France, when he gets home to Paris, there's apes on the ground, and he does. And then that's the end of the book, and you don't really understand why uh, there's apes. Is there ever a in, sequel to this book? No, <laughs> no, because you don't know if it's you don't know if it's a dream or if somehow maybe, maybe like like with space and time, like the apes from the planet of the apes got to Earth first. Like it's never it's never explained. Um, but he just gets back to France and then there's apes there. What I was trying to say by, by bringing us into this is that like a lot of these like well-known authors, they have the weirdest fucking random stories. Like, uh, like Stephen King, we all know about yeah. his weird shit with the ch- oh god child orgies, yeah, children, child, child gang bangs, and yeah. uh, the the one scene where I, I think it was the stand. I read a lot of this crap, by the way, in the stand where uh, one of the guy, one of the characters tries to offer the main character a hand job. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or an, or an, I mean, God, yeah, there's so much more in it as well. Where it's just yeah, where the leper tries to ha- uh to suck that kid's dick. <laughs> right, right, or like. Yeah, the bullies like all give each other hand jobs <laughs> and then try be, then kill each other. Uh, it's just weird. I shouldn't be God. I shouldn't be laughing, but like that, that that I guess that's the effects of writing a book on cocaine. Is just you just write random just, shit. It, <laughs> right. I mean, George R. Martin cross gender. You're, you're, you're the, the, the so the woman the woman was a telepath, and she had a ship. And then she realized that she wanted to produce a lover, so she cloned herself, but cross-gendered herself, so she could fuck her twin, her clone twin. So it's like her son. So she like grew this son. This is her plan. So it's like it's very like Jamie Cersei because you're fucking your your twin, cross-gendered. Anyway, she's she's a telepath. She's got the ship. She grows a clone that's cross gender that she plans on raising as her son until he's old enough to fuck. And then, but she dies while it's in the incu while she, while it's still getting incubated. So he like awaken, but her tell her, she puts her soul telepathically into the, into the computer of the ship. And then 
he grows up on the ship his whole life but because he grew up on the ship he's never been introduced to bacteria or viruses so he's really sensitive and he can't ever go to a human planet um and so he has to be a shut-in and live in like a plastic bubble he's like a bubble what's boy. this called night flyers right night flyers jesus fucking and so he's Christ. been flying the ship around his whole life as a bubble boy uh in isolation controlled by the evil spirit of his cross gender mother clone who like created him in order to have sex with him. But, but she couldn't cause she died. And, um, and they're, yeah, they're going across the galaxy to find a, a, a large alien that's repelling itself across the galaxy using tele- telekinesis. Um, dude, I, yeah. what the fuck is wrong with this guy? Anyways, we got on for almost an hour. It's, well, it's funny. It's fu- Yeah. But it's funny. Cause I'm always like, People are always like, oh, Preston Jacobs, man. He's got these tinfoil theories. I'm like, nothing I have ever said about any of the fucking stories is crazier than the shit George R. R. Martin actually wrote. <laughs> like, George R. R. Martin's r- written shit that's cr- Like, I've never come... Like, even Bolton. Like, any of these theories. Even Tyrion, the time-traveling fetus. What? Like, <laughs> oh. What the fuck is... We gotta save that for next time. Because I know it's like 12 okay. your time. And you gotta get to work yeah, tomorrow. Yeah. But, uh... uh <laughs> <laughs> nothing nothing is crazier than what George R. R. Martin's actually written. The time traveling I mean, fetus. <laughs> time traveling yeah, whatever. Yeah. We okay. we need to we need to go over that. But uh uh guys, thank you so much for joining us once again. We're also we're available on SoundCloud and iTunes as always. So check us out there, please, and follow myself or follow either myself or Preston on Twitter for all updates on the next episode of the podcast. And be sure to leave your thoughts down below. We may cover them in the future. Uh, I really want to hear this Tyrion fetus thing, but uh, <laughs> but uh, we are running out of time. Uh, Preston is back in the, in in Europe, and I know it's like it's probably twelve for you, right? Twelve a.m. Yeah, twelve twelve fifteen. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm okay. sorry about that. I didn't want to keep you up too long, and I got work in the morning. Um, but yeah, guys, thank you so much for joining us, and stay tuned because Preston will be reading you. The Black Bush chapter, where not the, not the whole chapter, the scene where Asha and and Carl the Maid have sex with each other. So uh, hope you enjoy that. I know I won't. Uh, but guys, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you all next time. Have a good one. Carl followed her up to Galbert Glover's bedchamber. Get out, she told him. I want to be alone. What you want is me. He tried to kiss her. Asha pushed him away. Touch me again, and I'll. What? He drew his dagger. Undress yourself, girl. Fuck yourself, you beardless boy. I'd sooner fuck you. One quick slash unlaced her jerkin. Asha reached for her axe, but Carl dropped his knife and caught her wrist, twisting back her arm until the weapon fell from her fingers. He pushed her back onto Glover's bed, kissed her hard, and tore off her tunic to let her breasts spill out. When she tried to knee him in the groin, he twisted away and forced her legs apart with his knees. I'll have you now. Do it, she spat, and I'll kill you in your sleep. She was sopping wet when he entered her. Damn you, she said. Damn you, damn you, damn you. He sucked her nipples till she cried out half in pain, half in pleasure. Her cunt became the world. She forgot Moat Kalin and Ramsay Bolton and his little piece of skin, forgot the king's moot, forgot her failure, forgot her exile and her enemies and her husband. Only his hands mattered. Only his mouth, only his arms around her, his cock inside her. He fucked her till she screamed, and then again until she wept, before he finally spent his seed inside her womb.